Um, so again, hello. Uh, if you're just watching us on, on YouTube, this is the first time we're saying hello. I'm Daniel. I'm the founder of Mount Tam Psychedelic Integration. I'm very, very glad you're here. Uh, Tam Integration is designed to be a safe, warm, welcoming, safe place for people who are deeply committed to transformation, spiritual growth, and emotional healing, and like to do so in the context of uh, plant medicine and entheogens. Today is um, Preparation 101, and the medicine that we're going to be talking about is Changa. I'm very happy and grateful to be able to welcome my friend, Pastor Bob, from the Sacred Garden community. Um, we've been friends for a while, and he has a church in a community that he runs out of Oakland and is a consummate expert in um, sacred plants. Um, their, not only their use, but also their cultivation. He's got a lovely urban garden uh, that is unlike any other, totally wholly singular urban gardens. Very, very lovely um, space to be in and a space that I'm really looking forward to seeing again when I come out there in a couple of weeks. So as I, as I mentioned before, um, you know, I will ask that, you know, whatever you learn here, you're, I'm, I'm happy, of course, for you to share. And if somebody asks a good question that, um, you know, please learn and, and share what you've learned with everybody, but let's keep each other's, um, keep the, your fellow attendees uh, information confidential. And also know that we can't provide you with anything. So we're also going to keep the space legal. Like there's not going to be any buying or selling or trading or anything that could be construed as illegal going on. And, you know, please, we ask that you respect that in throughout. Hmm. And so that said, I would like us to do a little bit of an opening meditation. And then after that, I would like to share a journaling practice with you that I think is kind of very useful for both preparation and integration. And um, uh, anybody who was here last night, uh, we talked about it a little bit and uh, and inspired me to speak about it again. But what I would ask that you do is just let your spine be straight and let your heart be open and just relax any of the musculature that might be getting in the way of you filling yourself with breath. So just notice as you draw breath in, if there's tension through the jaw or the throat or the shoulders. Notice if there's tension around the ribs or even tension around the belly where the diaphragm, hopefully is just very gently lifting and falling. And taking a few breaths. And also allowing, as you start to breathe, allowing yourself to sink into your chair or onto the earth a little bit more. Sometimes we notice that as well as holding the breath, we sometimes almost hold ourselves up, right? It's like we hold this tension in our diaphragms or our um, hip girdle. And just see what's possible to relax. And as you relax, I would just invite you to feel very welcome here. And sometimes if we are plant medicine or psychedelic people, we don't always feel welcome everywhere. We don't always feel welcome to share the things that interest us. We may have been judged in the past. We may have a little bit of that judgment has been internalized. And just recognize that you can drop that. Recognize that if you have thoughts or opinions or questions that it's totally cool. We're excited to hear them. Just also recognize that we're talking about a sort of lesser known sacrament that you may have only heard discussions of other plants. And so 
just allowing yourself to be very curious, maybe even a little excited to learn about something new. And even though we're meditating with, you know, quiet voices and deep breaths that we're allowed to have a little fun with it. All right, but hopefully this is enjoyable. I just, you know, the, in these circles, I think that it's nice to think about how nice it is that we're all here. And that, you know, I, I just, I, I just want to extend gratitude for you being here. I would like you to invite you all to extend gratitude as well to everybody else who has shown up recognizing that it's cool that we're all here and that we're here together. And so just kind of shine that out to the 26 other people who are here. And at the same time, just sort of open to feel that same appreciation coming at you from 26 other people. Just think about how cool that is. Maybe especially shine a little bit extra of limitless love and appreciation, right? Immeasurable, limitless love and appreciation to our special guest, Bob. And you're welcome to sit in this meditation for a little bit longer with your eyes closed. You're welcome to open them as well. I just wanna chat about a few things and I'll try to be quick, you know, so that we can get to our main event. But I'd love to share a journaling practice with you which is a particular kind of set and setting journaling practice. And I've been finding this very useful actually in terms, and I've found it useful in the, you know, for psychedelic journeys. And I've been finding it very useful lately as I've been doing some dream work, trying to recall my dreams and trying to explore them. And one of the things and I, and I think that it fits for tonight because sometimes the sort of the trip to mean space can be very dreamlike and we can see things that don't make sense and meet creatures and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, that are unusual. We don't always know what's real or not real. And so one of the things that I have found recently in, in, in my dreams is that I can't always recall a lot of them. Like a lot of my dreams escape me. Like I sort of remember it right as I'm waking and then a lot of it is fleeting and then I'll jot some stuff down and I'll really only get a little bit of it. And what I find is a little bit is enough and that especially if I can remember a little bit of my setting and a little bit of my mindset, right? So if you're new, the idea of set and setting is Mindset is your mindset and setting is sort of your location where, where you choose to have um, your psychedelic experience. When I come out of dreams, I can usually remember my mindset in my dreams. I can remember that, oh, that one of the overarching experiences of my dream was that I was um, sad or happy and proud or victorious or frightened, right? So there'll be a general mindset. And then I can remember that, oh, I was in um, an office building. You know, I was in a swamp. I was in a forest. I was at a train station. 
almost archetypal places, you know, if you kind of redu reduce it down. And so I talk to a lot of people who have psychedelic experiences and there's lots and lots and lots of details. They're trying to sometimes figure out what they all mean. And was it real or did that really happen? Or what, you know, what is the underlying meaning of that vision? And I'm so often interested in like, well, what was your mindset through it? You know, were you afraid? Were you victorious? Were you proud? Were you happy? And they're like, oh, and then we work with that. You know, instead of wondering about um, the objective, the outside, you know, how do we turn our attention to what's really going on inside and realizing that our hallucinations, you know, are really secondary to the mindset. And so I just wanted to share that with you, you know, it's the idea of journaling on, you know, the re reality of our experience, the reality of our feeling tones, the reality of our hearts and minds. And that's all. And, um, you know, I encourage you to, uh, to give it a shot, you know, you know, write a couple of pages, write a couple of pages on the inner experience, you know, focus maybe a little bit less on the weird stuff that happens. Not that that's not fun too. So that's all I wanted to offer. And then I'd love to, you know, I'd love to pass the mic to Bob, you know, thanks again for being here. And, um, I'm actually going to unpin myself and give you the whole screen. Thank you, Daniel. Are you ready for me? Yes, please. Oh, thank you so much for that nice meditation. That was really grounding for me. So thank you. And, uh, and also just kind of coming in, I want to express to this crew, I think that everyone knows it, but Daniel, I just have so appreciated the work that Tam has been doing for so long and particularly on the preparation side with sitting for psychonauts and this preparation 101, this is a little bit rarer, I think uh, kind of surprisingly rarer. And so I'm, it's, I'm really happy to be a part of this and, and glad to be, to be uh, chipping in with Tam and looking forward to your visit. And we're gonna talk today about Changa, which is uh, one of the sacraments of the Sacred Garden Community Church. And it's a sacrament that has been least kind of named uh, and known since the early 2000s. So it's a newer form of a, of really a, of a ancient and traditional sacrament called Changa, spelled C-H-A-N-G-A or X-A-N-G-A. And that's uh, pretty much a Western made up name. Um, I think I'll tell, say a little bit of the sort of boring hist historical stuff that you can find uh, just looking on Arrowid, if you do a search for Arrowid, comma, Changa, C-H-A-N-G-A, you'll, you'll find some of this, but also I won't spend too much time on this stuff. <clears throat> but it's kind of interesting that the plants that make Changa are the two plants that make ayahuasca, and we're going to go into a lot more depth there. And, it, and it's, uh, it's really like you could think of, of Changa as ayahuasca in a, in a pipe uh, in many ways. A guy named Julian Palmer from uh, Australia claims to have been the first inventor, and he certainly was an early inventor. He was using an uh, DMT from a tree called uh, an acacia tree. Um, I think acacia confusa he might have been using. I'm not sure which one of the acacias he was using. And then uh, also using a monoamine oxidase inhibitor from the Syrian rue seed. Um, that was Julian Palmer's recipe, and then he had other things he would mix in. But actually, a few people had been thinking about this for some time. Jonathan Ott had already mixed uh, uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitor with, uh, with DMT extracted and was trying it. So it's sort of something that emerged out of the Western technology applied to traditional plants. And it came really from a few different areas in the early 2000s. But this guy named Julian Palmer from, uh, from uh, Australia's gets a lot of the credit. I think he was one of the main early inventors. Just want to say thank you for to beautiful Changa for the wonderful lessons that you teach for the gentle teachings that you can offer. Also want to thank beautiful Changa for being a really wonderful uh, source for I, I think of it as as for almost like soul healing hygiene for recurring work. Experiencing that gratitude to Changa. 
this amazing uh, sacrament. Very good for initiatory practice for newcomers um, because it can be controlled and it can be a shorter, uh, but also good for experienced practitioners who want to have a shorter journey, but it, actually be able to get some work done on a Sunday afternoon and maybe go back and use the journey to integrate a previous long journey or, or do other kinds of work. So um, now finally, we're going to get into the real, really what Chung is about. And I want to encourage people to interrupt me anytime. And I guess I'm going to probably take about 20 minutes or 25 minutes maybe talking. And then hopefully that'll leave a good 15 minutes or so for, for Q&A. The first thing I'll mention is Changa is, uh, I just, I, I love this because if, if you're someone who enjoys ayahuasca, then you may also find Changa to be useful. However, uh, Changa compared to ayahuasca tends to not cause the nausea or the loose uh, stomach that um, ayahuasca can cause. And rather than being sort of a three to seven hour journey, each inhale on a changa pipe often will tend to last somewhere between six and 15 minutes, depending on, on the person who's engaging. That, but it's a very, it's the experience many people will report, it's as if Mo Mother Aya, someone might say, has come, uh, has come in to visit, but for a short period of time. And this is, I think, probably because Changa is combining the spirit from the two plants. The first one is the beautiful ayahuasca, Yahe. Here's a lovely Banisteriopsis ka'api uh, plant just growing here in the garden locally. Just a really beautiful, simple, um, regular petiole leaves like this. This is the ayahuasca vine. And that will provide the monoamine oxidase inhibitor that, uh, that makes the DMT last longer. Or if you take it orally, it just makes it even available at all. You take the monoamine oxidase inhibitor from the, from the yahe, and then you also mix that with the e extraction of the... Um, Psychotria viridis plant. This is the most traditional uh, ayahuasca. So actually here, I've just got this kind of big plate with a lot of leaves from Psychotria. Um, actually, I think this one is Psychotria alba, these particular leaves here. And if you take, th th this would be about uh, maybe 100, 120 grams of leaves here. This would make about two doses if you're, in, if you're drinking the ayahuasca, but it would make about probably eight or 10 doses of changa. And then this is just twigs actually from the yahe vine. This would be enough of the twigs to make about two doses here. This is about, um, let's see, it's about 80 grams, I think of the twigs. And this can vary the number of grams per dose depending on the plant. So th taking these two plants together gives you ayahuasca, DMT from the psychotria, and a monoamine, monoamine oxidase inhibitor, beta carboline uh, from the yahe vine, that makes the orally active ayahuasca. But that lasts a good, can last a good four hours or six hours, ha can often have a lot of nausea. Uh, it's, that's a wonderful sacrament for doing a certain kind of work. But for um, changa, we, we extract those plants and we do a really fine extraction, which is I think why the Western scientific sort of community came up with Changa. We, we, I, I'll do, uh, I live in Oakland, California. I was the um, founding chairperson of that Vikram Nature Oakland movement. And a lot of what we had in, in Oakland was we asked to be able to process and extract these plants. You can grow them legally already, but you can't legally extract them. So. What I'm talking about uh, is within the framework of Oakland, we can do the extractions, or also if you have a sincere religious practice with these plants, you can do extractions and consumption in the United States. I'm really grateful for the United States that we can do those extractions here if we're coming from a sincere religious practice, or at least within the local jurisdiction, you can have some decriminalized spaces. We were just looking at DMT from the psychotria and we were looking at a monoamine oxidase inhibitor from uh, the yahe vine or leaf. 
I'm just going to show a few other examples. This is a living uh, Psychotria. This is a Psychotria alba here. I have, I have Psychotria viridis and Psychotria carthaginensis growing here. See the beautiful roots coming out of that start. Isn't that lovely? So this can be a source to extract the DMT. This will have NN DMT in that. Um, I'll most commonly do an acid base extraction um, using food grade sodium hydroxide and um, something called, uh, and then a nonpolar solvent. It's, it's, a, it's a process. You can also do an extraction with limonene uh, and um, vinegar. That's another technique that can be done. And um, you can do the extractions on the, the chacruna leaves that I was just showing you. You can also do extractions from other plants that contain DMT. For example, here is a lovely couple leaves from uh, Acacia confusa that we have growing out in the yard. You can use even the twigs and leaves of the Acacia confusa have some potency, although the root bark is most potent. You can also do an extraction uh, from the mimosa. I like to work with mimosa hostilis root bark. Here's some mimosa root bark here. You can do an extraction there. You basically first do a hot lemon juice, kind of like hot water uh, simmering with a little acid in it, like lemon juice. Then you make that a base and then you put a solvent on top and you extract a solvent. This is a little bit more detail and, and we do actually have workshops on that, but I'm not gonna teach how to do the extraction today. Um, and then you put the extracted material from the solvent in the freezer and it will actually crystallize and make beautiful DMT crystals. So you use the, in order to make Changa, you do need to get through a, a, a pretty good extraction. Mimosa root bark is a really good way to go. Acacia is a good way to go. If you, if you have a garden and you can grow it, the psychotria leaves are also a lovely source for the DMT. Any of those will work. Then you'll also use, uh, you can do uh, powdered Syrian rue seeds. This is about three grams of Syrian rue seed right here, which would also be enough for an oral dose of ayahuasca. Um, this really potent source of monoamine oxidase inhibitor. You can toast this these seeds very lightly and then powder them. And that would be a source of the monomain oxidase inhibitor for changa. What I like to use is are the leaves from the, uh, from the yahe. So what I'll use for my changa is the, the leaf from the yahe vine, which you see here, which will have, actually people don't realize this, the leaves from the ayahuasca vine are, are a really good source of monoamine oxidase inhibitor. They're really as potent as the bark or as the, uh, the, the body of the vine. The, but the body of the vine is real easy for people to carry and trade. And so they've, it's just traditionally has been used uh, the, the big thick bark of the vine, but you can also use leaves. And so here we have the leaves of the ayahuasca vine. And then I'll take the extracted DMT uh, which is, it can be an orangish crystal or a reddish kind of gummy looking stuff. Or if you have a really nice extraction, you can get a nice creamy or even a, a, a brilliant white uh, extracted DMT. Uh, dissolve that in a little ethanol. I like to put about uh, maybe 10 or, or so milligrams of, of uh, DMT per each little pinch, like a half of a bowl, a small bowl of, uh, of, the, of that leaf, of the ayahuasca leaf. So for me, my changa recipe is the leaf from the yahe vine with the extraction of the mimosa root or the extraction of the psychotria leaf uh, placed back on the leaf. So that, that's my recipe. Some other people will use extraction from a, different acacia plants, uh, you could even use a Phalaris grass extraction or Delosperma extraction. So it can be different sources. Uh, most, many people will use the shredded bark from the ayahuasca vine or the leaf of the ayahuasca vine. Some people will use things like mullein or blue lotus flower or, or something like that uh, for the leaf. I, I like keeping it really simple. For me, it's the, the two plants that make ayahuasca, the, the sort of center pieces, although there can be others, but those core two, and then the extraction from them placed back on them. So it's really straightforward. 
And then this is what it looks like. This would be what the chunga would look like. So you can see the leaves from the ayahuasca vine. You can almost see uh, a little bit of the, of the extraction on that. If, you, if you're looking in the light shines just right, you can see some of that, some of the material actually even on it. And, and again, I like to make about 15 milligrams in a pipe uh, for, for dosing. And, and I'll do that by kind of measuring the amount of the leaf and then putting, dissolving the DMT on ethanol in ethanol and pouring that back over the leaf. That, that's how I'll make the, 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 uh, the uh, changa. And then in order to have a ceremony, and Daniel, we should talk about this, we're gonna have a ceremony. Um, each, each person in a ceremony needs to have your, well, the way I do a ceremony, it's nice if you have your own pipe. So a nice little glass cannabis pipe will work. I like to have a dedicated pipe, preferably because it, it has a pretty strong kind of a certain smell that's really, you'll, it's very distinct. I, I love it that some other people will think it smells like some kind of uh, odd burned plastic or something. It has a different smell. It's like burning roots sort of. Um, so you'll put a regular amount in this pipe and we'll have a ceremony. Now, the way we do the Changa ceremony within Sacred Garden community, we have time for preparation. We take a little bit of time beforehand. We talk about the ceremony, do some preparation. Then we go into a quiet uh, psychological space, an introspective space. Um, we stop with all the chatter, and then we, we, we walk uh, over to a different location. And then we get into a, a circle uh, comfortably so that you can lay down if you need to. Each person will be set up with their own pipe. Uh, each person will have, will, someone will come around and, and provide the, the sacrament to each pipe. You should have a lighter and a pipe and you should know how to inhale and hold smoke. So that's is actually really important. If you, if you haven't smoked cannabis or uh, some other kind of uh, herbal smoke or something, and you want to have a changa ceremony, it's a good idea to, to buy a little pipe and to buy something at the like at the head shop like mullen or <laughs> something that you can learn how to exhale inhale for four seconds eight seconds 12 seconds 24 seconds depending on how deep you want to go and then hold that smoke into eternity is the way i like to say it you you in if you take for the now we'll talk about the way the ceremony works but um for the smoking process you we will generally encourage sort of a handshake or, an, or uh, a more of a, uh, a hug or a full embrace. For the handshake, you might inhale for three or four seconds. For like a, a friendly hug, you might inhale for eight seconds or 10. If you wanna go into a really deep journey where, where you may actually have an opportunity to do some deep work, <clears throat> you might inhale for 12 or even 20 or 24 seconds, right? Just slowly inhaling. Um, like you're smoking cannabis, like just a slow inhale and then holding your breath. And no one has ever had a problem of, of not of breathing. So you, you don't need to worry. You can hold your breath as really as long as, as is comfortable. And often what people will find is they'll inhale and they'll be holding their breath and their whole body will become transparent to oxygen and everything changes at that point. And so I like to say holding your breath into eternity. <coughs> Excuse me, I got up something in my throat. Um, for the journey uh, with Sacred Garden community, what we like to do is we get in that circle. Um, everyone gets prepared. There's a facilitator and there's a support, a support facilitator for safety. Uh, about one out of 20 people sometimes will get a strong dose and, and might uh, think they need to pee or, or, or somehow get confused and get up and kind of wander around during the ceremony. And sometimes if you're really having a lot of the changa in your body, uh, then you, you might think you can get up and start moving around, but you're not really seeing very clearly and you kind of can be unsteady on your feet. So we'll have a sober support facilitator present. What we will do is ring one bell that we generally recommend to be that handshake. It's like approach the sacrament with respect, get to know her before you, uh, before you try to do everything you possibly could. Right, so start in a respectful way. It's like an initiatory uh, dose for the first bell. We'll give about 15 minutes or so. 
to, to process that experience, it will ring another bell. And then you might have a, a deeper embrace experience. We'll give another 15 minutes to process. We'll ring the third bell. And that would be an opportunity to go as deep as you possibly would desire. By that time, you probably have a little bit more familiarity with that sacrament and, and I'll say her spirit, although I don't wanna gender her, but that's just the way I was have, have heard her refer to. So then we'll have the three bells and that, that the entire ceremony will take about an hour. And um, after 20 minutes, after the fourth bell, usually people start to feel pretty solid. And it's an amazing uh, sacrament in this regard. Often people will have a really deep journey. They will be uh, visited maybe by the, the, the whatever that wise soul that came up in the last ayahuasca journey, so, some opportunity to revisit and, and integrate a previous journey or maybe new work or opportunities for new learning can happen. Occasionally one out of 10 or 20 or, or, or so journeys, someone may have a really profound uh, sort of universal breakthrough type of experience. So the full range of antigenic experiences can be available over that 45 minutes. But then it's uh, really lovely because usually within a half an hour or so after that, people feel very solid. And so like, you know, I'll, I'll feel like going home and doing my laundry and, you know, getting work done. Feel, feel almost like I got a, in fact, I, I'll call the a, a, a Changa Journey Day Entheo Gym. We, sometimes we'll hike out to a, a place in the Redwoods, we'll have a Changa Journey and we'll come back and just feel strong after that. Um, so it can be a really lovely working sacrament for, for kind of growing that spiritual health and, and experience. Um, let's see, anything else to look at here? I think that's probably pretty good. Um, we looked at the main plants, the, the, the two, the, 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 the ayahuasca vine and the chacruna leaf that can be used to make changa. Um, those are the core ingredients, the, the essence of those two plants. You can also use other plants like mimosa or acacia and searing and rue. Um, We'll talk a little bit about how to use the material. We could talk more about experience, but I think that's pretty good. How's that for a little, a little introduction there? I think that was just lovely. I thank you. And what I will do is, before we open it up for questions, I would just like to tell everybody who's watching us on YouTube, um, well, thanks for watching us. Um, please check out the other Preparation 101 videos and please come live. We're, this happens on the second Thursday of the month. And if you go to TAM Integration, you'll see Prep 101 and there'll be a Zoom link. And these are all free. We accept donations, but that's not a big deal. And we just want you, you know, to learn and to be safe. And I do hope that I get to see you uh, live and in person. And please check out Bob at sacred, sacredgarden.life. Yep. Yeah. And um, yeah, thank you so much, Bob. And I suppose now we will, we'll cut and we'll open it to questions. Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to repin Bob and I'm going to edit this. So this answer gets into the YouTube as well. Uh, Whitney, yeah. thank you so much. This, this fabulous. Let's pin Bob. Yes. Let's and Whitney, that's a fantastic uh, I hope that's okay with the naming, but that's a lovely uh, question. And, um, and in fact, I did a lot of homework. Uh, I, I had a pretty strong intuition on the dieta side. So the, the, there's the two kinds of, I, if, I'm get, if I'm understanding, you're really kind of asking two different questions. They're closely related. They're both about preparation. One is on dieta and contraindications, and the other one is around any guidance for maybe soul or, or pr practice preparation. Yeah, yeah. And so on the dieta side, um, that's an, e uh, an easier one in, a w in many ways. Um, and you're, you're spot on. It, it's containing the two plants that, that cause uh, the ayahuasca experience. Um, and the monomane oxidase inhibition of ayahuasca often creates a cause for dieta. I mean, there can be a lot of reasons for dietas. There can be many different reasons. But particularly with ayahuasca, there's a phys physiological reason to avoid tyramines that can cause high blood pressure and headaches and, and a lot of discomfort, right? 
and, and even potentially in, in some people maybe who have hypertension, that could be physiological risk. It, you know, so if you're going into an ayahuasca experience, you want to avoid things like brown eggplant and uh, uh, avocado and dried fruits and fermented soybeans and all kinds of things that have a lot of tyramines in them because they'll give you a lot of contraindication experience. I talked with uh, Sacred Garden Community has a, a relationship with a group called Spirit Pharmacist, which I really recommend. They, they do good work. I spoke with Keelan Thomas, who's also a personal friend associated with that group. And um, it's very interesting with this, with this plant because, uh, and Dennis McKenna also had comments on this, and, and it, which is the, the beneficial impact of the monoamine oxidase inhibition can be present because with the smoking experience, even if there's only one milligram, let's say, of a beta carboline, the, the, the good stuff in the leaf, when you inhale it, it'll go directly into the, through the, into the brain or into the, the, the re receiving neuron system and can cause the beneficial impact. So, so compared to pure smoking DMT, the, the chunga comes on with a smoother onset and it lasts longer. So it gives you more time to, to get a grip on what's happening and it's not quite so unsettling going in. However, that one or maybe at most three or five milligrams of monoamine oxidase inhibitor that you would be likely to inhale during that hour ceremony time is not going to be enough to cause those longer uh, reversible monoamine oxidase inhibition problems. It's like it just comes on for, for that sort of five minutes when the, when the molecules are going into your body and um, it helps open up that experience, but it's not going through your whole gut and all of your physio physiology with like 30 or 40 milligrams of the, of the beta carbolines. It's just like three or five milligrams. So I, I have really direct history and I, I asked because some, some people were, were pushing me on this generally prepar pre-preparation with dieta for a changa experience is not required yeah um and 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 that's borne out in experience it's like i've i've really never ex had anyone dem you know coming out of the changa journey with with the, that tyramine symptoms which i've experienced tyramine symptoms from ayahuasca and it's not real pleasant and that, and also this is another thing I like about the changa, which is that it doesn't, it's not associated with all that uh, nausea and everything. It just doesn't really tend to happen. It's just, it's a much lighter experience in terms of physiology. For, for psychological preparation, one thing that I found is really wonderful. Th these journeys can be as, as if they can, they're integration oriented journeys. So if you're doing other journey work, if you've had a really long maybe a hard journey where a lot came up uh, or, or you know, Dan was, Daniel was kind of, you know, it's like, what was that? You know, I, I, you're trying to figure that out. Then um, it's very interesting. It's uh, particularly if you do Changa work over a period of, of months, like a journey a month for several months or something like that. It's like, you can go back to the space that you were and, and, and it's like, oh, there you are teacher who, who had that to say, you know, or, or, or here are those things that I was trying to organize or figure out or get, make meaning out of or integrate into my soul, right? So one way that I have encouraged people to think about this is if you've had a, a previous journey that you're kind of struggling with integration, then you might bring intentions to, to revisit and reintegrate even sort of during or after the journey space. And that, that seems to be a really interesting one uh, that, this, that this particular sacrament's really useful for. Um, some people also will have problems with uh, um, getting the, you know, some people will have physiological challenges with ayahuasca or mushrooms. But if you want to work with a natural sacrament, this can also be useful. I'm thinking about preparation. Then everything else, Whitney, is standard, in my opinion, which is I would recommend coming into the journey with some intention. Also, if, you, if you're having some challenges, maybe try to get some clarity on what those are. Don't, don't move into the journey with just a, a fuzzy, messy mind space. You know, Try to get some clarity on why you're going into the journey space. All the standard uh, preparation, and, and that could be a whole different talk. Right. Yeah. Hope that was useful.